probably wondering what is this white girl about to say about African American heritage, because I would be thinking the same thing if I was in your seat, honestly. But um, I'm going to do this first piece. I'm going to tell you about myself, and then I'm going to do another piece. And if you like it, let me know. If you don't, be nice, because I'm sensitive. <laughs> she would become invisible or even oh, better oh, oh, oh. just forgotten oh, oh, oh. or even better just forgotten her tear stained pillow made her feel safe at night the jiggling of the door handle always made her jump fear of the unknown mommy's boyfriend coming home drunk she would dream of how it would be so one day grow up how she might one day grow up and magically become pretty how she might one day grow up and somehow obtain one of those video vixen bodies she spent hours in the mirror, her family made jokes about how conceited she was, but really, she would be conjuring up ways to make herself better. Ugly is what she defined herself as. The way she really felt about herself and her heart was covered up by padded bras, putting on a facade that she thought she was perfect. She succeeded in hiding the fact that really, she felt worthless. Sticks and stones were never a threat to her. Because she learned early to be a fighter, but words, words broke her. Especially the absent words from an absent father. Broken promises followed her like a shadow in the twilight, barely there until it hit midnight. And these broken promises turned into cries. Tears soaking her pillow, but to her demise, they were dry right before the sunrise. So her battle was never known. And her secrets were never told. And not because she didn't want anyone to know, but because no one would take the time out to listen. So she learned carefully how to bottle up her emotions until eventually she would lash out on the one to whom she was closest, her mother. The greatest example of strength that this little girl would ever see. And not just of strength, but of beauty and resiliency. And ironically, the last memory this little girl has of her mother and her father being together is her mother on her knees. On the very floor, she would faithfully clean. The trash can went from his hands to over her head. Broken eggs and spaghetti painted a mosaic of yellow and red. Seemed that her daddy liked it better when he made her mother cry and scream instead of smile and sigh instead of buying her nice things like makeup and rings. He preferred to make up her face himself with black eyes and broken jaws, not so trendy things. This is what this little girl thought love was supposed to be, a perverted picture painted by her parents. And so one day, this little girl's mother finally gained enough strength to walk away. And this little girl walked in on her mother, hiding her cries and drying her eyes. And at that moment, this little girl promised herself that her children would never, ever see her cry. This is for the young woman on this stage behind this mic. Fists clenched, palms sweaty, far from invisible because God took her pain and turned it into a pedestal so her one silent voice can now be heard by many. She's a modern day Esther. She will save her generation from themselves because she remembers all of the hell and all of the sleepless nights by herself. This is for me. I remember. The first time he touched me, it was like I could finally breathe. And I was willfully drowning in his waves of unexplainable peace, and he held me. And it was beautiful. And for the first time in my life, I realized that somebody wanted me wholeheartedly, unconditionally. There was no more need for padded bras or covering up my flaws because he knew them all way before I even did. And he still died for me in spite of my sin. He was chasing after me long before I knew him. That safety I felt at night was him. And this, this is for you, that you might know him. That the sound of my voice might somehow amplify the sound of him knocking on the doors of your heart and you will willfully let him in like I did. This is for you, young girl. This is for you, young man. I refuse to stand up here behind a facade of perfection, but I stand before you broken. A beautiful mess held together only by my Savior's blood. This is for you, young girl. This is for you, young man. He wants to put you back together again, that the tears you cry will be from him, from the joy that he will fill you with. This is for you, young girl. This 
is for you, young man, and I beg you to let him in. I beg you to let him in. Thank you. So I'm like straining my vocal cords a lot right now. Um, but that was a piece that I wrote um, three years ago or something like that. And over the summertime, I got to perform it in California in front of 4,000 people. And it was like my biggest dream come true. It was really cool. It's on YouTube. If you look up Leah James, it's on P4CM. I don't know if you've heard of all that. But I'm also on YouTube, Leah James. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to use your cell phones in here. But if you can, you can take out your phone or you could just remember my name. Look me up on Instagram, social media. I have a lot of um, new projects coming out. I just released a video last month on January 20th called Dear Black Man. And that's why I'm here. Well, not really. But <laughs> so um, I'm from Chicago, born and raised. My mother died when I was 13 years old. And I moved out to the East Coast. And um, I have like a really long story, but I'm trying to tell my life story in like two minutes so I could do this next piece. So when I was 16 years old, I suffered from a brain aneurysm that ruptured. How many know what a brain aneurysm is? Because I had no idea what one was until I had one. And I had a total of three brain surgeries and I woke up four days later, all my hair cut off, it grew back, thanks to Jesus. And it was horrible being 16. And like having your head shaved, that's all I cared about. I didn't care about like almost dying. But so I lost my short term memory for three years, strongly for three years. Like people told me that I wouldn't be able to get my license. I wouldn't be able to live alone. I wouldn't be able to um, live alone because I'd be cooking, like the phone would ring and I would forget. I would never be able to live a normal life with any without any assistance. And I never believed them because God spoke to me when I was in the hospital and he told me that he doesn't do anything less than perfect. Yes. <laughs> And now I'm here today, I'm 25 years old and my memory has fully come back and I travel alone all the time. God is amazing. And if he never took away my memory, I never would have tried really hard to memorize my poetry so there would be no Leah James today. So the reason why I'm gonna do this next piece is when I moved out to New Jersey and growing up in Chicago in a very diverse neighborhood, I never really knew that like racism was a thing because there was like two white families on my street and I mean, I got picked on for being white, but I never was hated for it. And it was more so hated for being poor and all this stuff. And then I moved to Hamilton, New Jersey. And if you know any, if anyone knows anything about Hamilton, New Jersey, it's right outside of Trenton and it's like all white people. It's really weird. I didn't know that like neighborhoods existed like that. So I got called a lot of names in high school because naturally I flocked to people who didn't look like me. And I just got like outraged by the racism that I experienced because I was going to an all black church and there's still no white people, there's like one or two, if I remember correctly. But I was living in two different worlds, an all black church and going to an all white high school and then living in a family. My sister's husband's from Pakistan, so like my life was very mixed and diverse, but I experienced a lot of hatred and met a lot of people who were filled with a lot of hate. And being a Christian, it really bothered, being a human being first, it really bothers me because I don't care what your faith is, racism is not okay. Ethnicism is not okay, Islamophobia is not okay. Anything that looks at others as in that they're evil is not okay. And I feel like when Christ was here on earth, he was always for the downtrodden. If Jesus was Christ, Jesus Christ was here right now, he'd probably have on a Black Lives Matter shirt and would be protesting. And I don't, and that a lot of people would probably disagree with me because they say, oh, all lives matter. Of course all lives matter, like, duh. I mean, I feel like that's like a given, right? So I was like, who, what could I do being who I am, being so passionate about people of color and specifically black people? Oh um, my God, I want more platforms to write a poem. So I wrote this piece called Dear Black Man, released it on YouTube and it hit over 3,000 views in like a month, which is like nothing compared to other people, but people don't know me and that was beautiful. So I'm gonna do that piece for you. If you like it, great. If you don't, once again, I'm sensitive, so. <laughs> Act like you like it. Dear black man, I am not staring at you because I think you are going to rob me. I promise. I will not hold my purse tighter when you are around nor lock my car doors just because you walk by. I cannot stop staring at you because your beauty is breathtaking. It reminds me of safety, of protector, of strength. Your melanin holds manuscripts of those who created dynasties birthed by queens who first populated this planet. Your melanin is magic. This is no Mandingo memoir, 
nor some type of sick fetish, you are no object, nor oversexed male, you are lover, friends, you are no thug. Let this serve as a reminder that your life matters more than just to people who look like you. I speak for the people who look like me who may actually just be afraid to say it, that without you, there is no America, no so-called land of the free, where your equality is said to be subpar to even me. There is no revolution, no passion, no art or music. There is no renaissance, no birth, no breath, no life, no me, no spoken word. You are the creator of good things. God's image is etched into your very being. Black man, you are no boy. The pavement was never meant to be your grave. Blood splattered shirts were never meant to be your attire. Your skin was never meant to be a target. Your smile was never supposed to fade. Your wings were never meant to be caged behind bars in a country that you helped build, symbolized by an eagle. Despite the hypocrisy you forgive, black man, it is okay to cry. I will cry with you. We will cry with you. Solidarity was never meant for the cold hearted anyway. Let's leave the hate for the media and the lies that they spray. They spit on your character as though it were dirt in attempts at making the blind see they are no savior. They are serpents, poisoning society, lacing eyes shut to oppression, manipulating minds to make them think that the selling of young black men to the prison system is just a figment of their imagination. Black man, you are no slave, no convict, no criminal. You are brave. You are bold enough to face another day in a country that teaches that your face should be feared. Black man, I thank you for living, for being. Forgive the stares of strangers. They may be out of fear, as in reverence, as in respect, as in awe of such a precious life. Black man, you matter. Black life matters. Thank you.